Welcome back to the Real News Network. I'm Paul J. in Baltimore, and welcome to a new edition of Reality Asserts Itself. I think to most rational people, if one surveys the global economy, you would have to come to the conclusion that capitalism as we know it, at least, ain't working, certainly not working for most people. I guess it's working pretty well for a very few people. But over the last century or so, you could make the argument capitalism worked for a lot of people, a lot of people meaning in the United States, Canada, and Europe, not so much in Asia, Africa, and Latin America, except for a tiny elite. But even in the countries that seem to have done relatively well under capitalism in previous decades, you can't say that anymore. Most Americans are not doing very well, and the same is true for Europeans and Canadians, I think, can hear the thunder coming. So what's next? Is there a world, a life, an America after capitalism? So a lot of people are talking about what that might look like. And our guest, who joins us in the studio, is doing a lot of thinking and working about all of that. And now joining us in the studio is Gar Elperwitz. He's the Lionel R. Bauman Professor of Political Economy at the University of Maryland and the co-founder of the Democracy Collaborative. He's also served as a legislative director in the U.S. House of Representatives and the U.S. Senate and as a special assistant in the Department of State. His articles have appeared in many publications, including the New York Times, the Baltimore Sun, Foreign Policy, and so on. He's also the author of several books, including America Beyond Capitalism, the decision to use the atomic bomb, and his most recent, What Then Must We Do? Straight talk about the next American Revolution. Thanks for joining us, Carl. Glad to be here. Thanks for having me. So I, I know you're not going to disagree with what I, what I just said. I don't think you are. Let me add, some people want to go back to that kind of capitalism that was better, at least, for more people. I personally think that horse has not only left the barn, but that capitalism that was better for more people is also the capitalism that brought us World War I, World War II, and a lot of other catastrophic atrocities and climate change crisis. So I'm not entirely sure exactly why people want to go back to it, but there seems to be some nostalgia for those good old days. But you're not talking about going back. You're talking about going forward, and you're trying to imagine what that is. Uh, for most people that watch the real news, you know we often, not always, but often start these interviews with some personal biography. What does our guest, not so much what our guest thinks, but why do they think what they think? And that's what we're going to do now with Gart. So tell us your story. Uh, first of all, where are you born and <laughs> what, were the, what was the political culture of, of the household you grew up in? Well, I was brought up in Racine, Wisconsin, uh, at that time uh, an industrial, thriving industrial city in the Midwest, basing uh, farm equipment, industrial scale, case Western caisson harvesters, all sorts of tractors were being built. Um, it was a labor town, but my parents were, I think, would be called Eisenhower Democrats, moderate Democrats, and, but very oriented to, to the community. They were concerned about the community. They would help on community drives. My mother was uh, involved in the Cancer Society. But what, not, what, what did they do? They were not, not explicit. She would work to raise money for the cancer efforts. They would help do tutoring to kids. Uh, but they were not particularly political people. What did they do for a living? My father was an engineer, uh, owned a very, very small, he was partner owning a very, very small factory, made little p parts for farm implements. Uh, my mother was a housewife who uh, wanted to go to college, but the boys went first and she couldn't, couldn't go in those days. Now, Eisenhower Democrats, these are Democrats that vote for the Republican Eisenhower, right. uh, who was the American general in World War II and uh, represented a kind of more rational republicanism, but also a very strong Americanism. And do you grow up with Ameri the American the Americanism as a religion, in, the, in a sense? It was uh, it was not it was not explicitly political. It was about how do we how do we have a nice community? How are people better to each other? Couldn't there be more equality? Uh, in that community during World War II, the black migration came up to work in the industrial parts of the city. So it's the kind of city that would, in my high school, elected the one black guy president. It was very liberal in its racial policy and civil liberties, but not very political and beyond that, they're very moderate. And, but it had a sense of community. I think that was probably the most interesting thing about it culturally. Uh, I always tell this story, uh, they had a zoo and they had no elephant. So they put up a big kind of paper mache elephant with a slot and people dropped money in. And finally, the community got its elephant. That was kind of that feeling for it. So not, not explicit, but 
internally the culture was, was communitarian. And to what extent does the American narrative part of you as you grow up? And by American narrative, I mean uh, the shining city on the hill, we right. have to police the world or there's going to be chaos. America won the World War II and is safeguarding democracy and freedom and so on. It wasn't part of the game. It was not really the question people not within your Not part of your belief system? Not, it, wasn't, it wasn't central to anything um, at that point in time. It was peripheral. What mattered was uh, the kids going to college, being, having a nice, I should have been a doctor. I would have been a nice, that's what they wanted me to be. Um, do well what by the community. Where did you go to college? I went to college 1955. So it's in the middle of the McCarthy era. I was about to say, so your teenage years is in the midst of McCarthyism. Yep. And uh, I mean, you can't turn on the TV without some TV show talking about the Red Scare. It's the Red Scare, but more important in, in Racine, this part was political. It wasn't my parents weren't involved in it, but McCarthy was around. And McCarthy on the national scene, you know, attacked anything and kept the, the fear mongers of the, in the McCarthy era were extraordinary. But in Wisconsin, it was triple. They shot anything that moved politically. So my high school teachers were scared to talk about anything political, even though they were pretty liberal. Uh, but there was a whole generation that was, uh, that was kind of the culture at the level of fear. At the other level, it was how do you build a nice community? So those two things went side by side well, without much, ideology. How much do you internalize the Cold War narrative? The socialism is the, uh, communism is the great threat and... I, 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 when I was a kid, I was not involved in that. I probably didn't care much about it. I was going to be a, I was a smart young kid going to do either engineering or physics or math. I wasn't political. That all shifted when I got out of high school and into the University of Wisconsin at, at Madison, where I really became, I became much more political then. What happened? Well, I, I ran into, I think, a couple really important people. One of them was William Appleman Williams, the great uh, kind of radical historian. Uh, and he was at his prime in that point. That was a really, I was uh, taken, and many people were taken at that point in time, with the really beginning critique by the radical historians of the Cold War. Not, not just the critique at one level, but the historical deep critique, both culturally, ideologically, institutionally. It was being opened up in, in a big way in the historiography of that period. And I began to really, I, was, I have a Bachelor of Science degree since I was a pre-med in American history. <laughs> so I then switched to American history and, and then developed the historical ideas and, and dropped all the science and dropped the pre-med and dropped all of that. So college was where, where the, the world hit me and the whole new vision hit me. And what were some of the sort of, in terms of your understanding of history now, what is some of the mythology that starts to reveal itself? Well, what is interesting about the development at that time, and, and it was a very sophisticated development, not only of the power of capitalism, but the power of generating a culture and ideology which encapsulated the society and gave people ideas about what could or could not be done, including American imperial ideas, and how that was formed, not a, not a crude analysis of just the power of the corporations. Indeed, if you look back at that, who pushed for American imperialism at the beginning of the 20th century, it's not only Wall Street, it's the farmers who want markets small businessmen. So it's a very big culture, big theory of what and, they and were doing. And sections of the unions, too. And sections of the unions. Samuel Gompers, after World War I, is actually at Versailles helping negotiate the treaty. Absolutely. And the AFL-CIO later became very strong. So it's a much broader understanding of how the system works and how its ideology works than the conventional or crude kind of analyses of, of this. And that, that's what really I began to think a lot about and began to, to do research on. And that's what got me deeply involved intellectually and politically, uh, changed my life. So it's somewhere along the line here that you start looking into and questioning the whole use, uh, Americans' use of the atomic bomb at the end of World War II. Yes, it's, it, I started my PhD thesis on how Americans during World War II, this was at Cambridge, I was at the University of Cambridge, how Americans during World War II began to plan for organizing and controlling the global economic system. They wanted to run it, and they wanted to run it uh, for lots of reasons, capitalist reasons, but also ideologically, they thought it would, this was the way to make for democracy, liberty, freedom. That was all part of the ideology. And I was looking at how they planned that, and they did plan it. They had a whole theory of what we call globalization now, and the free market things you see today are extensions of that theory. And they had control. Everybody else had been defeated. So what I was, I was interested in that founding period, 
And as I went through it, it became clear in 1945 that they ran into the Russians in Eastern Europe. And how do you control the European economy if the Russians are there? That's what I was studying. And it turns out there are discontinuities in the negotiations over Europe in the spring of 1945. The U.S. gets very tough. We're going to have to move our troops to Japan. We better have a showdown with the Russians now before we move. And then all of a sudden they relax and they start being very nice to the Russians. And why did that happen is what really intrigued me. All of a, not explained. Well, what happened is the Secretary of War came into the President's office and he says, now is not the time in April of 1945 to have a showdown. Wait for a few months and I'll give you something better, namely the atomic bomb. So we're not going to get into the whole story of the okay. bomb now, but we'll, we'll do in the next part. But just in terms of your own thinking about the world and, 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 and what you would be doing with your life, mm -hmm. was this a, a pivotal moment when you kind of realized, and to give a, this is a spoiler for the next thing, uh, that the bomb, there were no real military reasons, uh, you conclude, and, and this is a, a rather cynical use of the bomb. Um, what does that do to your feeling about America and what you're going to do within the, with your life? Well, the, the atomic bomb story turns out to be part of it, but it was deeper because if you look back at the history of American imperialism, there are millions and millions of people who suffered under the hundred years of, of the attack. So I was building up to it, and, and indeed the bomb was a crescendo, but I had been building up to a different understanding uh, long before that. So it, it, it it crystallized something. We're going to talk about this later, but the most significant moment was after the bomb was used, after the Japanese publicly surrendered Radio Tokyo, but before the papers had arrived, they ordered the largest bombing raid in world history, 1,400 bombers. And that tells you something about the culture and the ideology and the ongoing intensity of the system that was generating all this and the culture behind it. So it's deeper than the bomb decision. It's really implicated in the culture and the institutions. So the process leading up to, and this, as you say, as the crescendo, your understanding of, of the use of the bomb, um, this is a, completes a phase, at least, of your radicalization, can I say? Yes, in and, some sense, yes. And then, so what do you do next? Well, then the question is, what is to be done? <laughs> yeah. And I had worked prior to this for two years in the House of Representatives for a very, very liberal congressman, uh, Robert Kastenmeyer of Wisconsin, Representative Madison. So prior to the going to Cambridge to do my PhD or finish my PhD, um, I'd been in the House of Representatives and had, I knew how to do that. And, and he was one of the most liberal guys and we knew how to get legislation passed that period. It was the John, Kennedy Johnson era. And then there was the Goldwater debacle, which brought in a change of 76 votes in the House. And Lyndon Johnson at that point, at that point, Lyndon Johnson was the most progressive de Democrat there was. On the, he hadn't yet gone to Vietnam. And a new senator, a very liberal senator, was elected from Wisconsin, Gaylord Nelson. And he asked me to come run his legislative division. So I said, uh, yes, let me do it. Um, happy to do it for a couple of years. We'll see what happens. So I went to work in the Senate to see how that, and I also wanted to learn how did it work on the inside. I really wanted to do that. And did you have some hope that some real reform was possible from the inside? At that moment, that the 89th Congress, the House had changed 76 votes because of Goldwater, and the Senate was very pro-Democrat. You could pass, you passed Medicare, you passed Medicaid, you could pass progressive legislation, water bills. It was an amazing moment. And for a moment, I thought that was possible. And of course, after the next election, it disintegrated, and we went back to the norm. But at that particular moment, and that's a very odd, add two years in the U.S. Senate, I happened to be running a legislative shop, and we could pass all kinds of legislation at that point, including legislation to set up community ownership and to pass. We did a bill at those days, 33 senators, including half liberal Republicans, to set up community-owned industry. And they put it in, it's actually, if you look carefully, it's in the party platforms of both parties, because we wrote it into the platforms. Mm -hmm. And that all went away uh, after the election of 1996. And then, of course, the Vietnam War took it all back to what, what was the norm. So there was a brief moment, but it was aberration. And I, and I realized it was an aberration. And, and what's your experience during the Vietnam War? 
Well, the, I was involved in the Senate at the time of the Gulf of Tonkin resolution, which laid the basis for expanding it. And it was obvious to me that this was a phony. Okay, really quickly for some of our younger viewers, um, you, uh, this ship, American naval ship gets attacked, and it, uh, later we learned that this was essentially what they're now calling kind of false flag operation. Uh, yeah, it was, uh, there was something happened in the Gulf of Tonkin off of Vietnam. Some speedboats or motor probably didn't actually do much damage, if any. And that was the excuse, just as we went into the Iraq War, for what was called the Gulf of Tonkin Resolution, which gave the president authority to go to war in Vietnam. And it was a phony. It's now known to be a phony, but it seemed to, to me and to several people in the, working in the Senate it was a phony at the time. And I happened to write the legislation to try to limit it. Uh, we got it up and we got the majority leader to say, yes, this has got to be limited with making a record, which is supposed to mean the interpretation of the law, uh, but we didn't get a vote. So it, it was you know, a gesture to try to limit it. But they were going to war. They, they understood what they were doing. And it was just like the going into the, uh, the, the recent war in Iraq. It was a, a calculated move and they wanted to go and they did it. Mm. And what do you do? Well, I was, I was finishing up in the Senate. Um, my book on the atomic bomb came out in 1965, the 20th anniversary. I was still working in the Senate. It was uh, front page of the New York Times, front page of the Washington Post, saying the U.S. dropped the bomb to scare the Russians, which is the major, slightly over dramatic interpretation. Um, the, and I was working in the Senate, so it was a remarkable moment. Uh, the reviewer in the New York Times was Clinton Anderson, who was the chief, had been in Truman's cabinet, he was the chief of the mm. nuclear lobby, and he reviewed it. And I ran into him one day in the Senate, and he said, oh, I, I didn't realize you were Gaylord Nelson's assistant. I would have written a different review, son. <laughs> <laughs> That's the way the game was played. I mean, what you did is question something rather at the core of the post-war American narrative. This is not America the good guy uh, defending peace and democracy and such. This is America using wep a weapon of mass destruction to make a political point. That's right. That's the argument. I think that's most people around the world understand that. And a good part of the American histori historical community understands that, though it's still debated. Most historians now agree the bomb was totally unnecessary. They understand that, both in advance and re in retrospect, yes, in retrospect for sure. And in advance, the intelligence estimates said the war could end easily. We know that now. And then a number of historians agree, and around outside the United States far more, that to threaten the Russians, implicitly threaten the Russians, was a big part of the decision. But at that moment, that was big news and shocking and uh, very well, dramatic. Well, you're accusing the, the uh, president and the, and the military leadership of slaughtering tens of thousands of people. Hundreds um, of thousands. Hundreds of thousands of Civilians. people. Civilians civilians and unleashing a weapon that I, I know some of the yeah. critique of this is that it, it, there may have been as many people killed in conventional bombing but it opened the door to the use of this kind of weapon right. that begins what you know could have been and still might be the end of the world and unnecessarily without reason uh, it, not you know you mentioned the civilian leadership and the military so far as we know the military didn't want to do it all the major generals all of them with one minor exception and all of the admirals involved went public after the war saying the bomb was totally unnecessary. Eisenhower, MacArthur, J Admiral, the chief of staff to the president, a very conservative Admiral Leahy, and a good friend went public saying it was barbaric. LeMay, Curtis LeMay, the tough Air Force general, went public saying this was totally unnecessary. The military, so far as we can tell, was not for this. So this was all driven by Truman? by Truman and the Secretary of State Burns was, was coming out of diplomacy, not out of the military. The military was, many of them were shocked by it. So, so uh, but now you write this, you're in the Senate, you have, yeah. you have unraveled, uh, <laughs> you know, one of the most important myths of, of Americanism, uh, Vietnam War, uh, then what? Then I get an odd call from an ass Assistant Secretary of State who is the guy in the State Department who does the UN side of the State Department, would I like to come out of the Senate and be a special assistant? Now, this is odd. I've just written the book we just talked about saying America had started the Cold War and bombed these people unnecessarily. And I, what is this about? <laughs> and it's the middle of the Vietnam War. So I, I met with him. And what had happened is we had 
Arthur Goldberg, who was a chief just was a justice for the Supreme Court, moved to become the UN ambassador, and a new part of the State Department to back him up. The assistant secretary was brought in, and he asked me to be his his chief assistant. So I, I didn't know what this meant. So I uh, I went over to another senator's office, famous that young people probably don't remember, is Frank Church, who was a leading senator who exposed the CIA. His office was right across the way. And I said, Senator, what should I do? Because he's on the Foreign Relations Committee. He said, well, go ask them if, if they tell him you want an FSR1. You want to be, that's the top of the rank. Top, you can't go higher. Tell them you're going to do this to study bureaucracy. <laughs> and tell them you want to control anything on Vietnam that goes through the UN which is really the most important point. Mm. And so I did that. I said, in particular, I want, to, I want, the, UN, I want the Vietnam portfolio, because that's why I would come in. Maybe I could do something. Maybe I could help. So he agreed to all that. And, uh, and well, Why do you think? Why? It's very interesting, because what he really wanted was, I worked in the Senate, knew all the Senate aides. He didn't care about books. He wanted the, my connections with the Senate aides who I'd gotten to know over two years, and he thought that would help him in some way. I think that's why I did it. There's no way we're going to cover the whole scope of everything <laughs> you've done in your life. Uh, not because you're 77 years old, but because you've done too much. Uh, but I just want to jump from here ahead. But, but from here, at this point, do you still think that the, the basic problems facing people can be solved within capitalism? No. You don't think so at that time? At that time, I thought there might be a path to move the whole thing way over to a left social democratic position, maybe. So there was, a, there was the potential for some kind of a social democratic, progressive, more rational capitalism. I doubted that leaving the Senate, because that was such a brief moment at 19, the 89th Congress. So I had grave doubts, because that was a moment, but it was aberrant. It was an aberration. So I had grave doubts, and I went to work on, in the State Department because I thought I could do something on Vietnam, maybe, and lasted one year, and, and then left and joined the anti-war movement. So um, after that, it became increasingly obvious that unless you change the system, really fundamentally change the system, you weren't going to get anywhere, and that that was the challenge. I'd been moving in that direction, but, but that was, I think, crystallized by that experience. Okay, well, in the next segment of our, of our interview, we're going to deal a little bit we're going to do one segment on the bomb, because Gar was the first one, I think. Were you the first one? That People speculated about it. To make, you were the first one to make the case yeah. uh, on, on, the, on the use of the bomb. And then we're going to pick up what will become the main theme of this series, which is if capitalism is out of answers, then what, what, what might have answers? Yeah. So please join us for the continuation of our series of interviews with Gar Alperwitz on Reality Asserts Itself on the Real News Network.